So in our coverage of gene expression and regulation, we've been talking about the fact that cofactors can assist RNA polymerase in um, activating transcription on a promoter sequence. Now there are proteins that are involved in this process and they're called transcription factors. There were two things that we talked about that can actually um, mediate this process. One of them is when you actually have an allosteric change in a protein itself that will then activate transcription. So you may have a protein bind to a motor sequence to RNA polymerase which makes the RNA polymerase itself twist and activates its activity. You can also have another example where it is actually the DNA itself that's bent and twisted that would actually allow the RNA polymerase to move along and initiate transcription. Well, the first thing I want to show you here today is an example that I just thought of today just as I was kicking around the house doing some chores. We have um, my door, my front door, and we've got this door itself, which we, let's just call this entire door the RNA polymerase. So if we were to consider this entire door to be an RNA polymerase, we'd need something to help activate it properly and something that would actually cause an allosteric change here in the door. Well, if you can observe here, we've got the lock on the front door. Uh, this being, again, this whole door being the polymerase itself, and we've got this lock. So this would be a source where we could actually get an allosteric change. But the question you might ask, you'd be asking yourself is, well, what is the transcription factor? What's the thing that's going to come in and activate that? Right here, I've got different sets of keys. Now, I can't cover that in extreme detail here, but depending on the environmental conditions, intracellular, extracellular that cells experience, specific transcription factors will be recruited to the promoter sequence. We've talked about that very briefly. Now, let's say that I take this transcription factor that actually goes to a lock uh, of my office at work. and see if this actually works here. All right, it will not fit. It will not fit into that lock. So, so this transcription factor, under the current conditions, for whatever reason, it's not able to provide an allosteric change onto this RNA polymerase. Probably not even able to bind the DNA. We can't even get into that proper binding site. However, if I take the key to the actual door itself, right here, this being our transcription factor, we've met all the conditions we need to begin transcription of the specific gene. Let's see if it'll find a binding site onto the DNA. There it is, all right? So we've got our binding site. Now, what I want you to imagine, there's a whole lock mechanism right in here. I'm not changing the lock me mechanism at all. I'm not adding parts, I'm not removing parts. I'm only adding this cofactor, the key. Now when I turn the key over, I get an allosteric change here in this locking mechanism, all right? If I move the key in the other direction, it'll change the allosteric mechanism itself. You'll end up having a different shape of the lock and the door can move in and out. So the other thing that had been presented and is in your textbook was the discussion that it's not an allosteric change just in the protein, but there's an allosteric change actually in the DNA itself. So if we had here our DNA double-stranded at this point, um, we could have a transcription factor come in. At this point, I guess the top of the zipper would be our polymerase, and here my hand would be transcription factor. It would come in, it would actually bind onto the polymerase um, and you'd end up getting a twisting of the DNA itself. So it's actually that twist or that movement that would allow the DNA itself to become, become unzipped and open up and you'd actually have active transcription happen. So that is the second example of the type of change that can happen uh, on a promoter site when you have a transcription factor bind. So while you're here, I've got an idea for another demo I can show you really simply over here in the test kitchen about something we discussed in terms of methodology used to identify the DNA binding sites of some of these binding proteins. Let's check it out. Okay, one of the methodologies we covered in the prokaryotic gene regulation section is called nuclease protection footprinting. And it allows you to determine what sequence of DNA uh, DNA binding factors will actually bind to. So basically I've got trays of chocolate chip cookie dough arranged here in these long rectangles. Now if we were to equate this to being nucleic acid, so let's say that we're starting with the same exact nucleic acid, we simply have four copies of it present here on these uh, cookie sheets. Now, the whole idea is that the actual binding proteins themselves, the DNA binding proteins, would essentially bind a specific sequence of this DNA and protect it from being 
cut by an endonuclease. So something has to serve as the protector, you know, the binding protein itself that will protect these linear DNA sequences. Once again, all of them being exactly the same, we simply have four copies of them. So here I have one of these little bread pans, a little mini bread pan that we've got. And this is going to be our DNA binding protein. Okay, so here we go. DNA binding protein right there. And we're going to place it in a certain point right here. We're just going to set it on top of one section, all right, of this DNA. So each segment of DNA is going to have one of these binding proteins placed onto it in identical positions. Now, the other interesting part of this methodology is we have to label it with radioactivity. So how is it that we're going to label this on its end with radioactivity? I've got right here some cinnamon sprinkles that what I'm going to do is I'm going to add on just onto one end right there. That's going to be my labeled end of DNA. The other ends of our cookies are not going to be labeled. Okay. So I'm going to label this one as well, exactly the same. It's going to be labeled just on that end. We're going to label this piece of DNA on the same end. Now, we've got, we've incubated our DNA with our binding proteins here in this example. And we need to treat with an, an endonuclease, all right? So we're going to be allowing an actual nuclease to cut at different sites from within inside the DNA strands that we've got here. Now we're not cutting from the ends. It's not an exonuclease, it's an endonuclease. So here we go. This is what's gonna serve as my endonuclease. In this reaction, it's my knife. So we've now produced a few different cuts to our cookie dough. Here we've got is a cut very close to our radio labeled end. Here we've got a cut that's right by the binding protein. So that piece of DNA is gonna be a little bit larger that has the label on it. This piece of DNA is going to be very long, right along here. It's covered by the DNA binding protein. It's protected. The knife couldn't get in there. So it cuts right here. Here's another one. This end, it's protected by our DNA binding protein. See, let me demonstrate. The fact is the knife, the knife can't cut that DNA because it's protected. So we get a cut all the way down to the end. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to cook these things up. We'll take them out of the oven in a few minutes and I'll show you what they look like. What we started with previously was all the same length of dough in the pan. And you can see here, these sprinkles basically represent, this would be the radioactive end of the DNA that had been cut. So the only thing you'd be able to see on an agarose gel, if you were to have these radioactive ends present, would be this. So now we've got these relative sizes of DNA and what will happen is that this piece is the smallest piece of all. It's going to run on the gel right absolutely at the bottom. This piece is a little bit larger. It's going to run a little bit, a little bit slower than this one because remember, um, the smaller the piece, the farther along the gel it will actually run. This piece of DNA, however, is very large. There's going to be a huge gap at this point. This piece of DNA also, very, very large. Notice how it's labeled at its end as well. And it's going to run also very, very slowly into the gel. So when we look at this, you're going to have a gap in the middle for all of the fragments of DNA that would normally appear here that, nor that don't now because there is a footprint, there is a void, there is a blank in terms of size. You have this specific size of DNA, which is very large. All these other intermediate sizes were protected by that pan. In terms of DNA, it would be where the protein sits to protect the DNA from the endonuclease. This is why you would see these different sizes of band appear on your agarose gel. So there you go. This is the uh, basically the cookie example of understanding nuclease footprinting, um, that method which we can utilize to determine where the DNA binding proteins actually bind on the DNA and try to decipher what DNA sequence they actually bind to in the sequence. So hope that helps.